Eternal God, you began the work of creation on the first day of the week. You said, let there be light, and there was light. So today we glorify you for your creating activity, the solar system, planets, stars, sun, moon, and earth, for everything big and vast, everything small and minute, we praise you, Lord. Jesus, you rose from the grave on the first day of the week, and we celebrate your new life and the power and the glory of this day. Come meet us as you came to John, Mary, Peter, and to Thomas. Dispel all doubts from our minds with your presence, drive away gloom, and replace it with joy, and assure us of your victory over sin. The Holy Spirit broke the weakness of the first disciples, and with your power, you made timid people bold for Jesus. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise, worship, and celebrate you today and join with millions of people from the east, north, south and west who will, like the angels of heaven, lord and magnify your holy name. We confess that there are times when we find worship difficult. There have been times when we are critical of the ministers and of our fellow Christians. We may be attending church to worship more concerned to receive than to give of ourselves. Please forgive us for the times when we are allowed, when we allow trivial excuses to defer us from joining with your people. When we think of the persecution the early Christians faced and more recently hear the re and read the trials of Christians in war-torn countries, we plead with you, Lord, to be especially present with those who are feeling discouraged, lonely, deserted, and suffering physical pain. Bless those who come to church troubled, or anxious, or sad. May they catch the glimpse of your glory so bright that it dispels the darkness of their souls and fills them with your light. Help those who are unable to gather with others through illness, old age and despondency, that they may receive a touch from you and that they too may glorify and praise you. Wherever those who have never heard the gospel before meet you today, may the spark of grace ignite a flame of belief and devotion that will blaze for all eternity. We pray particularly for mothers who may be battling with all types of stress Lord Almighty, be present with them. Help them to know you care and that you are only a prayer away. Continue to bless and keep and heal the sick in our community so that all may know your power and strength through difficulties and know the one who cares never leaves us in the cold. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning's reading is taken from Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 13. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light, and God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. 
And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which there is, in, in which is their seed each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the third day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Well, good morning and uh, welcome to St. James um, this morning. As you heard, um, today we're starting a new series in the book of Genesis. Um, we're looking at Genesis chapter 1 through to 11 in this series. Just from my side to all the mothers here, um, I pray that you will have a wonderful Mother's Day. I pray that you have been spoiled. Um, I pray that those of you who have uh, lost mothers um, recently or in a, in a past, that you um, that wonderful memories will, will come back to you as you remember your parents, as you remember your mother. Um, thank you for joining us, and I'm going um, to pray for us. Um, we're going to need it. We're going to need the Lord's help as you consider this, uh, this well-known chapter. I'm sure that um, as you have many times made a decision to, this year I'm going to read through the Bible, you start it with Genesis, right? And you carried on, and then you got Leviticus. And then somehow I dwindled off. And then uh, the next year comes. I'm going to start reading through the Bible. I'm going to start with Genesis, and I'm going to carry on, and we're going to get to Levit Leviticus again. <laughs> and it uh, starts dwindling off. And so um, I, I assume that Genesis 1 is well read. <laughs> well read. Because I'm guilty of that as well. <laughs> um, well, let me pray for us. And then we'll um, turn to God's Word. Heavenly Father, thank you um, that we have this privilege of gathering together, that we have this privilege of opening up your Word. I pray, Lord, that as we consider you through your Word this morning, that you'll please help us. Um, as we consider a familiar passage, please reveal yourself to us. Help us see you in a new light, even, um, and worship you anew as the God who created. Please arrest our thoughts and help us to be focused upon you. And help us to be a people that seek to be under your word and not above your word, for your glory's sake. Amen. Now, I've um, got a sermon illustration here to kick off with. It's a painting. Now, if I would ask you to describe what you see in this painting, then several of us will pick up on similar elements or similar aspects of the painting. We would mention the farmhouse that you see there. We would mention the, the massive tree next to the farmhouse. Uh, we would mention maybe the fence that's there, um, the mountains in the, in the background, the sky, the different colors. We will all pick up on those, those aspects of this painting. And, and some of us may even emphasize one or two key aspects of the painting, or even try to identify where the artist is trying to lead our eyes to through this painting. Now, we will get it right to describe this painting in detail. But there will be a limit 
to what we will be able to describe. You know why? Because we don't know the artist. You don't know the artist. But, what if I do know the artist? What if I know him intimately? Do you think it will make a difference in how I will describe to you this painting? Well, certainly, it will make a big difference in how I will describe to you this painting. For instance, I would be able to tell you that this farmhouse is his grandparents' old farmhouse in Mapumalanga. That the mountain behind the farmhouse is where his father used to explore when he was a boy. That just behind the tree line is a river that his father used to play clay light with his friends. I can even tell you how the artist felt while he was painting this painting. He was joyful, yet he was also sad because his father had passed away and he, and he longed to be where his father was, where his father grew up. See, knowing the artist makes a difference in how we describe this painting. And in a similar way, when we look at creation, Knowing the artist, the creator, will make a big difference in how we describe what we see. And that is what you find in Genesis 1. Moses writes about creation, but he writes it in a very particular way. It is a terrific literary text, structured with many repeated phrases and words. So a question worth asking is, why did Moses write Genesis as he did? And I believe the answer to that question is found when we understand or have, or have some kind of comprehension and understand the context that Moses and the Israelites found themselves in when Moses wrote the first four books of the Bible, Genesis being one of them. You see, Moses is not the only one looking at creation and explaining it, or trying to explain it. Two massive superpowers influence the historical context that Moses and the Israelites found themselves in, were the Egyptians and the Babylonians. They also looked at the heavens, at creation, and, and they looked at the earth and they, and they tried to describe what they saw, each in their unique way. And the nation of Israel was very much influenced by that context that they lived in. They were very much influenced by the Egyptians. They were very much influenced by the Babylonians. So Moses, who knew the artist, God the Creator, writes as God's Spirit leads him to address the ideas of the Egyptians and the Babylonians who influence the minds and the hearts of God's people, Israel. In Moses' day, Egypt and Babylon, the two superpowers, had a unique cosmology a unique view of the cosmos. And I think it's worth understanding something of their view of the cosmos before we look at Genesis 1. Why? Because the Bible's creative narratives that you find in Scripture are not in dialogue with modern scientific ideas about origins, but are in dialogue in a conversation with ancient Near Eastern cosmology, a dialogue with the Egyptian or Babylonian or Canaanite cosmology, their view, their understanding of the cosmos. And in that dialogue, Genesis 1 to 3 shows many similarities with other ancient Near Eastern cosmologies and many fundamental differences. So modern day cosmology is an account of the universe's origins as humans experience it. But ancient cosmology, ancient cosmology narratives 
do not have as their primary purpose to describe the physical material processes by which um, the universe came into being in language or categories that make sense to modern cosmology, to a modern mindset, to a modern audience. What they do have, have as their primary purpose is to address basic worldview issues. The nature and the purpose of the world. Who am I? Why am I here? And especially, to whom am I ultimately accountable to? Who are the gods? It's world issues. A world view. So for instance, according to the Egyptian cosmology, and you can see that on your handout that, I, that we handed out to you, Egyptian cosmology, notice the sky goddess who is the sky dome full of stars. Geb is the, the land deity. And Shu, the god of air, kneels on Geb and supports Nut. <laughs> the sun god Ra travels in, in the waters above the Nut, riding his boat across the sky, upper left, and descending into the realm of darkness and death to the waters under the land. And if you wonder what happens to the sun god after he enters into the realm of darkness, well, the picture below, Ra is pulled through the underworld, through the underworld sea at night. And the god Seth spears and defeats the deaf god Apophis, a snake, while the boat is pulled by subjugated night demons, jackals and snakes. See, that's Egyptian cosmology for you. And that is what influenced Israel, God's people. Now, according to the Babylonian cosmology, turn the page, an ancient tablet text expresses the traditions of the primeval waters generating the pantheon of old deities, which will be taken over by the young upstart god named Marduk, the patron god of Babylon. It begins with the uncreated or the pre-created or a pre-ordered state. So look at the, the writing underneath, um, just a little bit lower than on the page, in the middle. When on high no name was given to heaven, nor below was the neighbor world called by name, primeval Apsu, that's, that in, the language means deep abyss, was she who bore them all, so uh, was their progenitor. And creator Tiamut, the salt ocean, was she who bore them all. They were mingling their waters together when no gods at all had been brought forth. None called by names, none destinies ordained. Then were the gods formed within these two, the deep abyss and a salty ocean. So the waters brought forth the gods. And eventually the gods all developed with Ea and his son Marduk. At the head of the pantheon, Tiamat, salty ocean, threatens to take over with her chaos waters and she becomes a giant sea dragon. Marduk battles and destroys her, using half her body to make up the waters above and the waters below. So what you notice about Egyptian cosmology is that it ascribes divineness to elements. The sun, the moon, the stars, air, sky, waters, etc. They see it as deities. And this is called what? It's called pantheism. Pantheism. God is all and all is God. Babylonian cosmology saw different gods warring against each other to bring about the cosmos. Cutting in half and separating and warring and taking over. See, these are the two, the two superpowers that influenced the nation of Israel. So what is the point of sharing all of this with you? To start in this way, when we look at Genesis. Well, there are two main reasons. These thoughts and beliefs heavily influenced the Israelites. For 400 years, they lived in Egypt. And when they eventually came out of Egypt during the Exodus, these were the idols that they took with them in their exodus journey. 
the gods that many of them brought out of Egypt. These are also the idols that they adopted and worshipped when they took over the land of Canaan. This is what Moses is writing against, you see. He uses the same kind of words, the same kind of language by the Egyptians and by the Babylonians or even the Canaanite cosmology language. He's writing to give the Israelites a biblical understanding and meaning of the cosmos. Let's turn to the text. There are some common grounds between Genesis 1 and the ancient Eastern cosmologies. But there are significant differences. Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now that is an introductory statement. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the, and the earth. And taking that sentence together with chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all, all the hosts of them. There's, that's a closing statement, and that tells you that whatever took place in between these two verses, the opening statement and the closing statement, is what brought forth the cosmos as we know it. The word beginning in verse 1 in the original language is a word that refers to a period of time rather than a first point in time. And it labels what? What period of time? The seven day period of creation described in the remainder of Genesis 1, rather than a point in time before the seven days. Remember, it's an opening statement. So it provides an introduction to the period of creativity. It is like the author is saying, well, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now let me tell you how he did that. And then he continues. Verse 2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. You see the common language there? How important was waters with the Egyptian cosmology and with the Babylonian cosmology? Extremely important. Hey, but who's hovering over the waters? It's the Spirit of God. Now notice the three elements of this, um, what we'll call pre-creation state or pre-ordered state. Earth or land, in the Hebrew language, is land, darkness, and the deep, the deep abyss. So earth or land, darkness, and a deep abyss. Notice how it's described for us. Without form and void, or as some translations have it, wild and waste. In short, danger. This is dangerous territory. It's chaos, it's wild, it's waste, void. And Genesis 1 verse 2 describes this pre-created condition as it was understood in Israelite thought. This pre-creation state is not absent of matter, as the land and the waters are already present. But they are functionless, without order, and in that sense, they have no existence. See, John Walton, in his book, Ancient Near Eastern Thought and the Old Testament, he writes this, In the ancient world, something came into existence when it was separated out as a distinct entity and given a function and named. Separated, given a function, and named. And this is in stark contrast to our modern view of the cosmos, which is focused on the material existence or structure or of something. That's how we think. See, for us, the existence of the world is perceived in physical, material terms. But for the ancient biblical authors, creation was about establishing the functioning cosmos. Not about the origins of the material structure or substance of the cosmos. So, for instance, in our modern cosmology, water is something. But in ancient Near Eastern cosmology, the deep belongs to the pre-creation state. A neutral state, 
a functionless state, a non-organized state, a lifeless state, nothingness. So as a side note, and I struggle with this, and we all struggle with this for those who have this biblical worldview. So as a side note, some of us may be asking, so where does the land and the darkness and the water come from? Right? Did God not create out of nothing? Well, Genesis 1-2 describes matter that was part of the pre-creation state. So where does this matter come from? And Genesis 1-2 does not tell us. It's absent from telling us that. Therefore, we need to look at other texts in Scripture. So, for instance, John 1 verse 3, speaking of Jesus, all things, all things were made through Him. And without Him was nothing or anything made that was made. Even the pre-creation state. Jesus was there, and all things, even that, was made through him. So this would include a pre-create creation matter. But remember, and this is a struggle for us, it's a paradigm shift. When you read Genesis 1, to think how the author thought, how the people that he's writing to thought. So remember the wild and waste kind of language. The darkness and the deep abyss are all ancient Near Eastern terms, ancient Israelite terms, biblical images for nothingness, non-existence, a pre-creation state. There are three elements of disorder. And what fascinates me is that all three are separately addressed in days one through to three of creation. Day one. Light contains what? The darkness. Pushes the darkness and it controls the darkness. Day two, waters are separated and they are ordered. Day three, land emerges from the waters and edible plants from the land. See, all three of those elements addressed in days one through to three. They are no longer wild and waste, without form, no longer unordered. Notice the light is separated from the darkness. And it is what? It's named. The expanse separates the waters above from the waters below, and the waters below are named. And the dry land is separated from the waters, and it's named. Then on days 4 through to 6, God speaks, and what? He fills them. Day 4, the expanse is filled with lights. The sun, the moon, and the stars. Days 5. The waters below are filled with swarms of living creatures and the sky uh, uh, against the waters above are filled with birds, flying creatures. Day six, the earth is filled with living creatures and humans. So notice that in each case, what the expanse and waters and earth is filled with are given what? Purpose. They're given purpose. The lights to separate the day from the night, to be for signs and seasons, and days and years. Once that you can say, that's where time was created. Time came to be. To give light upon the earth. Two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. And stars, the birds and the sea creatures, to be fruitful and to multiply and fill the waters, and the egg, uh, waters of under the expanse. The waters above the expanse. There you go. I get confused too. Um, the humans to multiply, the land animals to multiply, the humans to have dominion, to rule, and we'll come to that next. They are given purpose. The land, the darkness, the deep are no longer without form, no longer unordered, and no longer empty. God spoke creation into being separated, named, and gave what he created purpose, functionality, function. In other words, God brought about what? Existence. He brought about existence. And you see this throughout the Bible, this kind of language. In one sense, Genesis 1 is the story of the whole Bible. 
You see this kind of language over and over and over again. For instance, Abram. What happened to Abram? After the, the Tower of Babel, 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 right? the people, what, they, <laughs> everywhere. And there's no hope. There's no hope until you read Genesis 12. And God separates out, He calls out Abram. He names him Abraham. And Genesis 12, He gives him functionality, He gives him purpose. He gives him an existence. An existence. You see that with Jacob. He's separated from his brother, separated out. He is named Israel. Israel. And he's given purpose, same as Genesis 12, to be a light unto the nations. Jesus. Not created, but incarnate. Separate. Separated. He's named Jesus. To save his people. He's given purpose. The Lamb will take away the sins of the world. Existence, if you will. He's incarnate. The church. The church. Separated. They are named the kingdom of God. They're given purpose. Same as in with Israel. To be a light unto the nations. To tell people of the gospel. To be different. See, this is the kind of God that we serve. That gives us existence, meaning. And this God is not all and in all. He's not pantheistic. Pantheistic God, no. Anyway, he's, he's not all and in all. He's not the waters, he's not the land, he's not the sun, he's not the stars, etc. Like the Egyptian cosmology would say. He is the creator of all. And the things that the Egyptians worship are the things God created and gave existence to. He's also not like the Babylonian gods that war against the deities to, in order to establish the cosmos. Look at what God is like in this chapter, in Genesis 1. Look at what He's like. His spirit is fluttering or hovering over the face of the dark, chaotic, lifeless waters, controlling it and ready for the word of God <clears throat> to be spoken. He creates order out of chaos. He speaks creation into existence. He invites creation to partner with him. He delegates his authority. A Babylonian cosmology would never think that. The deities have to have absolute power. They have to war. But, but this, this God is so big that he delegates his authority. And he rests. Notice the, the repeated phrase, and God said, let there be. Verse 3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Oh, and by the way, did you notice that the light here on day one is before the sun and before the moon on days four? It's interesting, isn't it? So who's the sort of light? Who's the source of light in day one? Well, who will be the light source in the new heavens and the new earth? Revelation 21 verse 23, And the city has no need of sun and moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb of God. Back to Genesis. The phrase, let there be. Verse 6, And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the water from the waters. Verse 9, And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. Verse 11, and God said, let the earth sprout vegetation. Verse 14, and God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. Verse 20, and God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures. And let birds fly above the earth across this expanse of the heavens. Verse 24, and God said, let the earth bring forth. Verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion, rulership, over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. This phrase, let there be, that is an inv invitory kind of language. It's an invitation kind of phrase. It is not like 
war language, like the Babylonian cosmology or the Babylonian gods. It is partnership. It's partnership language. Look at how he delegates his authority, this God of the Bible, to the two great lights. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth to rule over the day and over the night. To humans. Verse 26. And then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens. The delegated rulers above in the sky and below on earth. God shares his authority. It's interesting to note that God's delegated rulers mirror each other in one sense. See, the sun and moon both function as a pair that rules the day and night. On day six, the man and woman function as a ruling pair over the land, sea, and expanse, and the animals and the fish and the birds. To a pair ruling above and below. And he invites them to partner with him as delegated authorities under him. How big a God is that? To share his authority. And to be sovereign over all. And not try to fight to keep his own. He shares his authority. See, the God Moses describes in Genesis 1 is far different from the ancient Near Eastern ideas of gods. This God even rests after he created and gave creation its existence. I noticed something interesting about day seven. Day seven does not end. Did you notice that? It does not end with the repeated phrase, and there was evening and there was morning, the seventh day. Why not? Because that is where we are heading, you see, to the place of rest in a new heavens and in a new earth. And until then, every Sabbath or every Sunday, we are to be reminded of God's presence and the ultimate rest to come, which will have no end. It will be eternity with God. Lastly, let me point out one more difference from the Egyptian and Babylonian cosmology. Notice the repeated phrase, and God saw that it was good. That it was good. See, ending after God created humans, it ends with, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Very good. So why end with very good when he saw everything that he had made after the creation of the humans? Okay, it's not just he saw the humans and saw, oh, this is not very good. He saw everything that he made. And after he created the humans, he said, everything, very good. Why? Why would he say that? Because the good created is connected to what is needed for humans to have life. You see this God's great concern for what he has created? And who is the pinnacle of his creation? And after the humans are created, he looks at everything and says, now it's very good because why? They can have life. You can have life. You can have life. The land and its vegetation and creatures, the sea and its creatures, the sky and its creatures and starry hosts, all relates to what is needed for humans to have life. And it started with light. <laughs> Verse 3, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. And you know, when I read this, I cannot help but think again of John chapter 1. I think John chapter 1 was written in this way, and I think John borrowed much from the language of Genesis 1. John chapter 1 verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, 
And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was what? Life. And the life was what? The light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. It contains the darkness. It cannot overcome it. Jesus. See, in Genesis, when God says, it is good, and very good at the end, it is because it relates to life. But when Jesus was incarnate, it was not just very good. It was perfect. It was perfect. Why? Because in him was life. And the life that was in him was the light of men. A light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. When God created and addressed the wild wasteland, the darkness, the deep abyss, he did not remove the dangers of the chaotic sea and the darkness. Instead, he ordered. He ordered it and created life to fill it. And there will come a day when the dangers will be removed. In the last two chapters of the Bible, John again writes that there will be no darkness in the new heavens and the new earth, and the sea will be not there. But there will be light, God being the source of it. And it will be what kind of waters will be? Living waters, flowing from God to His eternal beings that's going to be with Him. But until that day, though God had rested from His creation work, there is one particular creation work He continues to do. He continues to do. And that He will never rest from until that day. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It speaks of this, doesn't it? If anyone is in Christ, anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The new has come. And guess what God does when he makes you into a new creation? He separates you. He names you son, daughter of my kingdom. And he gives you purpose, functionality. He gives you existence. Existence. Where is true existence found? It's found in Christ Jesus. The one who was separated, the one who was named, the one who was given the purpose. To live on this world, on this earth, without sin. To go to the cross. To take upon Him our sin. The Lamb that will take away the sin of the world. And be resurrected from the dead so that He can give us life. The light of the world to give us life. And in Him we have found existence. Existence. To make a difference in this world. All of the Egyptian and Babylonian gods were gods to be appeased. They were to be appeased. Yet the God of the Bible is a God that created a cosmos to sustain life, to give life, without humanity having to appease Him somehow. But instead, He gives even His own Son so that you can have eternal life. There's no way that you can appease this God. You can only receive this gift that He has given. His Son. So that you can have existence. True, meaningful existence. Let's pray. Lord God, we want to thank you for what you've given for what you've done, for what you've made, for what you've created. Thank you for giving us life. Lord, I pray 
that we would know our existence, that we will have the worldview that you want us to have, who we are, and why we are here, and who we are ultimately accountable to. It's you. And in you, Jesus, we find true meaning and purpose of life. Please help us to comprehend this and understand this and embrace this and say yes to you. For your glory's sake and even for our good, we pray. Amen.